Goliath Gauntlet is back with some Saturday action. Everything that went down yesterday is all in the past now. I'm joined with Derek Oswald, aka Charmer. It's good to have you here, buddy. We've got a, a pretty spicy matchup. We've looked at the deck list privately. We're going to dig into those shortly, Charmer, but oh man, it's going to be a day. Yeah, I am really excited to, first of all, finally be on the Goliath Gauntlet, but also to be covering this matchup in particular, because having a look at the deck lists, even though there's no Bravo today, it's the closest thing that I could probably hope for. And it's it's going to be exciting. I'm I'm really, really happy about one of these lists. Well, you kind of came out as the winner a little bit after the bans came through. Bravo got just a little bit more attractive after some of those bans that were announced uh, a few days ago. But ultimately, so let's start with Chris Ayali. Why not? Let's go take a look at Chris Ayali's list. He's bringing in Lexi Livewire and some uh, interesting little tidbits here. I mean, this deck seems to be heavily loaded up on Bolton Shots and Chilling Ice Veins. Yeah, this seems to be the way that most Lexis are going as of late, or at least locally when I'm playing my games, if I run into Lexi, it's been a little bit less of the traditional go wide and a lot more of this disruptive Lexi. You are using Chilling Ice Vein to make your opponents either pay the tax or discard cards. You're loading them up with Frostbites. You've got things like Ice Quake, a couple of red in Arctic incarcerations there as well. And yes, you still have those big explosive three of a kind turns, but the reality is this is not meant to be a deck that out aggroes the opponent. This is supposed to be a deck that is aggressive while also throwing disruption so that you can kind of slow down those fives that you wouldn't be able to just outrace entirely, but then still also have enough aggression to deal with the slower decks like the Oldhams, like the Icelanders, etc. Well, there's some good opportunities here because, again, Voltaire Strike twice can go ahead and load up two arrows, fire two arrows. You can give two arrows go again, essentially, and then end that combat chain with just a red incar uh, Arctic incarceration for free and just say, all right, next thing you do is going to cost you an extra blue right out of the gate. So this list is very fascinating to me because it does pack a yellow lightning press. And sometimes when you see a single yellow combat trick, a lot of the mentality with that charmer is not necessarily that, you know, I want to, it's a crucial element to the deck, but it does add seeds of doubt in your opponent's head. Now the deck lists are gonna be open, so some of that is not necessarily gonna bust through, but this is the quarterfinals, so they don't know that there's there. Once you move on to the semis, that's when the deck lists get opened up and you can see what there. But so that one yellow lightning press, it's similar to just running a single yellow pummel. Suddenly everybody's kind of playing around yellow pummel when you just show it once. And I kind of like that. Yeah, I love that because, as you said, the first time you see it, you're going, OK, well, does that mean they run the full rainbow or do I have to worry about that having just been a one of? It's also just nice to get up over the break points and the fact that Lightning Price is uh, something that you can do for free makes all the difference as well, because you don't need any extra cards to make it work as somebody who fakes a lot of pummels that usually requires two cards, the card you're pitching plus the pummel. But with press, if you've got a card in your arsenal, you just got one card floating in hand, uh, especially if it's an arrow and they assume, okay, well, there's no way they'll be able to pay to load another arrow. You can still get that surprise gotcha extra damage or in the case of this deck, get those on hits going because again, the chilling ice veins uh, drill shot is another potential one that uh, normally gives me nightmares. And there are uh, three red drill shots, a couple of yellows here as well. Uh, not in this matchup, but as somebody who plays a lot of Guardian, that's something that you don't want to have the on hit happen. So I, I love the inclusion of just this quick free combat trick that can get you over the top and get those on hits. It's moving along to Nathan Crawford bringing Briar, and in your mind you're thinking, all right, Briar, we know exactly what this is going to look like. It's a fairly, you know, is it Royal Briar? Is it more traditional? How redline is it? You know, but, you know, we're going to kind of lean on the fact that CMH is going to be the driving force of the damage, but that's not the case on this one. This Briar list is the most unique Briar list I've ever seen, and that includes, that absolutely 100% includes the PT2 list that um, Matthew Folks brought with the promise of plenty and really messing around with people. This list, a uh, charmer, is obscenely unique, is what I'll say. This list is haymakers. This list makes me so happy. It is uh, one potentially just anti Dromai. That was the first thing that stood out. I was like, maybe they're just really worried about Dromai because the number of attacks in this list that Swing for six, swing for seven is massive. We've got red Autumn's Touches. We've got red Barraging Brawn Hides, red Raging Onslaught. There are so many things that swing for six and seven in here 
it is wild. But then you dig a little bit deeper. You've got my favorite card in the game, Pummel, in the list. My favorite thing to do, make my opponents discard cards. And on that theme, we've also got three copies of Cryptic Crossing in this list. And I think that's a card that Rune Blades haven't experimented with a lot because it's a, got a pretty hefty cost. It is a three cost card itself, and you have to basically pitch two cards to it to get the bonus, but it's got a really powerful on hit effect where you take a card away from your opponent, you are gaining a card as well. It doesn't naturally have go again, but if you can give it go again, that's great. If not, that still gives you potentially a free arsenal at the end of the turn. I think Cryptic Crossing has the potential to be incredibly powerful. It just hasn't been experimented with a lot. And the main part about this is that as soon as you think of Rune Blade, you're always automatically just loading up a Rosetta Thorn. In this case, Reaping Blade is the only weapon on tap here, which is unique because it says, hey, for one one resource, attack for three. If your opponent has more or if a hero has more uh, life than the other hero, they can't gain life. So I have a suspicion that this is kind of a list that is just going to trade damage like a mofo and just swing heavy because it's it doesn't want heroes to gain life. Sigil of Solace, things like that are not really going to get you through there. Uh, I, I feel like this is also to a degree kind of a little bit of like anti Icelander tech to a degree where, you know, you're not going to gain like I'm going to take damage, but then you're not going to gain any life. So uh, it's, it's a very, very fascinating build. I'm really, really intrigued to see how this one plays out. And against something like Lexi, Frostbites are going to be problematic because so many of these attacks, like you mentioned, are, are haymakers. They're fairly expensive to put on the board. Yeah, I think ultimately that's going to be the story of this matchup is what does this deck do when it is taxed so heavily? And Ice Lexi actually might be the worst of the ice heroes for them to run into just because they have so many ways to apply the tax consistently. Yes, old him. You've got Channel Lake Frigid. Uh, you know, the whale is still legal as of right now for this round of the gauntlet. So you do have to worry about the frostbite there. But because this isn't a very heavy go again rune blade list, really the ice react doesn't matter as much when you're playing into Ultim. Similarly, you go to the Icelander side and because you don't have a lot of go again, if you're just starting your turn with a haymaker most of the time, <laughs> them reacting by playing that instant and donating the Frostmite, it's it's too late. And I say uh, Frostmite, but I mean Frostbite, obviously. There's no little icy bug there. You don't know maybe, that. Maybe that's you don't what's giving you your cold. You've been infected by the Frostmite. But yes, the Frostmite, the, yes, nipping the, at my the, toes. The point here is, is that uh, Ice Lexi of the three heroes is the one that kind of donates the Frostbites the most frequently during <coughs> the own turn so that it carries over. And so I think that it's weird. They might have ran into the wrong ice hero here for this particular first round matchup. I, I'm curious to see how it plays out. Well, again, we're uh, we're just here to sort of ride the shotgun on these uh, awesome matches. Big thanks again to LSS for providing a wonderful prize at the end of the rainbow here, which is a gold foil uh, Goliath gauntlet graded by PCG grading as well as kayfabe cards who come up huge as always so big time ups to kayfabe cards let's get to the match charmer it is time to play the goliath gauntlet the goliath gauntlet is brought to you by kayfabe cards where reality and fantasy meet go to kayfabecards.com for all your pokemon magic the gathering and flesh and blood needs. Kayfabe cards. Be who you want to be. Starting up, Charmer, it is uh, time to go. And a lot of this is just seeing sometimes the surprise on somebody's face when they're loading up. And, you know, how many times have you loaded up to a game, you've you sat across from somebody, say, what hero are you playing? And they'll say, oh, it's this or it's this. And you kind of know more or less what you're up against. And then you say, oh, it's Briar. And then they flip a Reaping Blade. Like that just turns the entire game upside down. Yeah, that's the sort of thing where you kind of do a double take and you go, um, excuse me? Did you forget your Rosetta Thorn at home? I, I don't understand what happened here. Or perhaps they were just uh, expecting a different matchup or they they sideboarded wrong. I don't know. I can't remember the last time I actually sat across from a Reaping Blade just in general, because when you think about the history of Rune Blade weapons, they've always been incredibly strong. And Reaping Blade has very rarely, if ever, been a part of that conversation. But 
Uh, speaking of strong, it looks like this barraging Bronhide is coming in strong right out of the gate. Yeah, barraging Bronhide is uh, another one of those fascinating cards akin to things like, you know, Wounded Bull, uh, Finals Fighting Spirit. They have effects uh, that kind of put them over the top, just put them above rate in terms of value. In this case, it's not going to get that way because it needs, uh, if it's not blocked by two cards in hand, then it gets plus one. So in this case, it's just going to be a seven blocked fairly, I don't want to say weekly, but, you know, it looks like Chris Ayali is content to take some damage here, go down to 38. And I, I suspect it's because there's cards in hand that he's, he quite covets. Yeah, because this is turn zero, obviously they're going to get to draw back up to four. So that tells me that there are a couple of cards there they don't want to lose early. Maybe it's a three of a kind or one of the other really powerful cards to fire off with Lexi. Maybe they have a chilling ice vein paired with another ice card ready to go. Uh, we'll find out, obviously, here in just a minute. But that is uh, a lot of damage to take this early on. And especially if your opponent says, hey, I'm playing Reaping Blade, you know that their goal is to get things low early. And it does look like uh, we've got some arrows getting ready to rain down. So that's probably one of the cards that they kept, right? That rain razors. And then there's the three of a kind. So uh, this very well could explain why they kept the two cards that they did. Yeah, anytime you see rain razors open a turn, you know that it's a three of a kind turn. Usually you want to save it kind of as a little bit of a oopsie surprise we got you but you're right i think that the hand that chris Ailey had it was a rain razors that blocks for nothing and then the three of a kind which is one of those very you know full throttle kind of cards that you want to hang on to this is a very potent response by chris Ailey. he took two vanilla damage and is able to come back on this which is a chilling ice vein fused uh with the plus two on top so it is coming in for eight which is absolutely devastating considering that on hit, there are some devastating effects with the, that come along with this. Yeah, that is not what you want to see if you are Nathan, just because uh, we know that you want to throw these haymakers. You want all offense all the time. And so the minute you start having to pay uh, any sort of tax whatsoever, it's going to feel bad. And I think that's, again, going to be the story of this matchup. How do you play a non-traditional Briar with all of these expensive attacks against a deck that is going to disrupt you on almost all of its turns. And I do think it's rather interesting that Chris decided to keep the amulet as opposed to the Channel Lake Frigid there. This could just say, you know, they want to play the amulet at the end, uh, or maybe they want to load it into the arsenal and then use that to donate a frostbite with the flip the following turn. But Channel Lake Frigid uh, would have been an incredibly powerful card against even traditional Briar, but also potentially against this one, because again, the, the tax is very relevant. But uh, the amulet also going to come in strong. And uh, we've got some defense, it looks like, from Nathan. Uh, there is actual defense in that list. I think that part of the mentality there is that Channel Lake Frigid, if you suspect Nathan Crawford is just going to go for these one one-time massive attacks. Channel Lake Frigid isn't going to be as big of a hindrance as it would be against a traditional Briar that has like three or four chain links associated with it. So you're not necessarily taxing them over the top. It is still, don't get me wrong, a tremendous card. I think what Chris Ayali is doing here is hanging on to that amulet. It's a free card that you can flip off Lexi. You can open a turn with it, create a frostbite, and then start moving, right? You could start doing your, 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 whole, your whole game plan here. And given the fact that He's running nine chilling ice veins. There's a good chance that he's going to be able to peel cards out of Nathan Crawford's hand and make it hurt when it counts. So he's valuing the disruption over the fact that, hey, this channel like Frigid is going to maybe buy me, you know, one turn of relative solace. It might save me a reaping blade, whereas this amulet of ice will maybe not only buy me a couple cards from hand, but it might actually just buy me momentum, tempo, and to push damage through off of a fused a chilling ice vein. So um, I'm not terribly surprised, but again, it's just kind of like, well, these are both two good options. You kind of just got to put your eggs in one of those baskets. I mean, Amulet is a very powerful card, as we found out with the recent banned and restricted announcement. So we got to keep that in mind as well, right? It is going to potentially strip a card uh, or two if it's paired with that chilling ice vein, but... What's interesting here, and I want to highlight it, is we saw the rune chant into Reaping Blade the last turn. And as I look over at Chris's equipment, Chris did opt for the snaps and is not 
at the moment uh, using the null rune boots that he did have available in the sideboard. So arcane damage is going to essentially be uh, unblocked for the entirety of this matchup, and that might end up being incredibly relevant when the life totals get low. And we have another rain three of a kind turn firing off. Yeah, it's a good opener to the turn. Uh, he does run Bullseye's Bracers, or Bullseye Bracers, which do have the Arcane Barrier 1, but again, it's it's a it's an equipment piece that you don't necessarily want to hang around all the time. There might be a situation where Chris Ayali sees a window where it me, makes sense to use the Bullseye Bracer. We're going to see how much he covets the reload effect from Bullseye Bracer versus the Arcane Barrier effect from it, but this is like this turn, like the previous one, like you mentioned, Charmer, is... It's devastating. You're going two over the top. There's a chilling ice vein. It's going to get the freeze effect. Now, the question is, is does Chris Ayali go ahead and uh, trigger the amulet of ice? I think we are going to wait and see what happens before we make that decision. Because the nice thing about amulet is you can do it as an instant. So depending on how Nathan blocks this turn out, if they block it heavily for example then there's no reason for you to maybe strip that last card you kind of know what you're going to get uh, if they say hey no blocks then you say okay well i'm going to make you pay a different kind of tax uh we're going to see at least looks like one block two cards coming out there so with two cards left in hand i and you're going to get equipment wow that's actually really impressive i was about to say with two cards left in hand i think you would still consider uh, using the amulet here because that means you could get them down to just the one card plus the card in the arsenal so it's either going to be a, a pitch one attack or just a reaping blade turn again there's still another arrow left to be fired chris ayali i believe chose go again off of that arrow um it's a five spot out of the box with the red plus two off of the rain razors an activation here i'm wondering uh what did i miss looks like something was uh was pitched to in order to get rid of uh the frostbite and uh, uh, all things considered here chris ayali still gonna go ahead and and sort of take advantage of the fact that that chilling ice vein is going to be able to peel a card or pay and uh that's a difficult thing to to look at it looks like it was paid through for uh for the chilling ice vein effect uh sorry the fusion that puts the amulet on board nathan crawford now however is going to go ahead and draw some cards and gains a little bit of life yeah, so that's going to be off of the Spellbound activation, and that is the only Tome of Findall in the list. So I think that is probably the, the one thing you use your Spellbound Creepers for. As I'm looking at this, there doesn't appear to be many other ways uh, other than maybe giving you an action point off of one of the non-attack actions with Go Again. I think that this is just traditionally every time you have Tome lined up, you just blow the boots, get the value, and then move on. It's interesting no. that uh, for somebody who's running Reaping Blade, you've got so many ways to actually gain health in your own list because we do have the Findall's Fighting Spirits. We've got uh, the Tome. There's the Heart of Findall. They're just a really big fan of our Lord and Savior Findall in general. But he shouldn't have gained life here. Uh, I believe that that may have been an error because Reaping Blade is not only affecting your opponent. It affects all heroes. If a hero has more life than another hero they can't gain so nathan crawford technically should be at 40 here uh, because the findell's fighting uh the fine tome of findell should not have granted him life gain only cards uh so that's that is a perhaps a little oversight again so much going on it's sometimes difficult to just catch everything but that might be i might be completely wrong maybe there's a, a ruling on reaping blade that i'm not unaware of that it only affects your opponent but from what i'm reading I, the the text on the card it says that you are correct that there should not have been life gain there i think this might just be uh, again one of those cases of i can't remember the last time i sat across from a reaping blade and so perhaps either of these players are uh just not as familiar either but uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that because yes as as it reads to me it says any hero not opponent well, we'll uh, see if that factors in at the moment. Now, Chris Ayali, however, flipping a blue chilling ice vein, not the most aggressive of cards, but we can always go ahead and load up another one. This is a bolt and shot, if I'm not mistaken. Am I? No, that's a drill shot. My bad. It looks like a drill shot uh, for four. And uh, this is one that when you're a guardian, you hate this card, especially as old. And when you're running a rampart of the ram's head, you do not want to see this card. Absolutely not. You don't want to see this. 
Uh, I think even if you're somebody like Briar, because of the Fyandal's spring tunic, because if this connects, then you can kind of eat the tunic for free. And we have a follow-up of a Chilling Ice Vein. So this is actually going to be a really strong turn because that was fused for Chris. Again, a lot of pressure, a lot of disruption. And Nathan, again, wants to throw these haymakers, but so far has been blocking, I think, more than they would like and also has used a lot of their defensive options here. Uh, for a deck that runs so many haymakers, it is still running uh, three copies of Sync Below. As we saw before, there was also uh, the Respite that was played. So uh, you do you do have some options, but I, I don't think that that's what you want to do with this list traditionally. I think you want to go on offense. I think you want to be the aggressor and the disruptor. But uh, right now seems to be content with these, you know, make a rune chant swing with Reaping Blade turns. Well, it's a good way to just go ahead and throw damage off of a blue pitch. Again, it's uh, damage in two ways. Don't get me wrong. It's a far cry from what Rosetta Thorn is capable of, but the deck isn't built to support the Rosetta Thorn strategy. This deck is more so built to, you know, throw the big haymakers, like you mentioned. There's, and there's a ton of them. In this case, it seems like Nathan Crawford just is not finding them. He's not necessarily seeing the cards perhaps in the right sequence or he's just basically saying that whenever i find a, a potent hand chris ialli just comes at me with the most disruptive nasty stuff chris ialli's already you know cobbled together he's weaved together uh woven together a rain razors into three of a kind turn that has been relatively devastating uh i say devastating it's devastating in the sense that it's it's peeled a lot of cards out of nathan crawford but nathan crawford is sitting at 40 plus health and and that's that that means that you've essentially done no no work no progress all you've done is you fired arrows at trees and you know you haven't hit any of those nasty little elves yeah i think that is the one thing that is worth highlighting here because we traditionally think of lexi having these huge pop-off turns and you have to make the most out of your three of a kinds make the most out of your uh, rain razors but so far other than peel cards they haven't really got the job done and with only uh, one of each left in the list, you have to wonder, is this Lexi going to have enough gas to get there at the end? Now, I have seen some Lexis that have started running Remembrance to shuffle in those key cards, but I don't see them here in this list. So Chris is going to have to get there the old fashioned way from here on out, it seems, with just as much pressure, maybe go tall as possible. Uh, we do still have things like Paulson, the, the Ice Quakes and etc. So it's not like it's impossible, but... And two out of your three uh, a combo turns essentially are already out of the way. You're going to need some help. And here's here's my most exciting play of the game. We get this first cryptic crossing. It's a cryptic crossing, but it's only been paid for by one of the two criteria to get it over the top. It says uh, cryptic crossing is a six attack cost three. If an attack action and a non attack action cards were pitched to play it. The first time this deals damage to a hero, they discard a card, you draw a card. And I think that the first time this deals damage is a key metric on this because this seems like a card that, you know, with Shock Charmers can really just destroy somebody's, you know, love of the game. You know, what's interesting is the further that I look at this list that Nathan brought, I don't know if there's a number of ways to trigger Cryptic Crossing. Uh, beyond the Tome of Findall that we've already seen played. Because as I'm looking at the red cards that are in the list, there's not really many non-attack actions. They're all big attacks, which makes sense. But if all of your non-attacks are blue and you have to pay with one of each into Cryptic, that tells me that you're really just playing that for a six attack with upside at times. Because even when I when I go to... Uh, the sideboard, the only other one that jumps in is Diabolic Ultimatum. You could cycle that through, but that is it. And uh, that that kind of changes my view on where they were going with this. I think that their move was basically to just creatively pitch. You pitch like a red attack and then a blue, and then you've got one floating, uh, you know, to a degree. And who knows what that one floating could represent. Maybe you've got another pitch. You could pummel that card. Who got, you know, who knows? Ultimately, however, um, it's it's yeah like you said any card that have very specific criteria to play it typically have very you know very aggressive or very potent uh on hit effects or something like that or the game text is just this like you know it, it's a laundry list of detriment however 
there are ways to do it. And with all the red attacks, the red autumns touches, raid, you know, barraging brawn hides, command and conquers, there are definitely ways to creatively pitch to get it. The question is, is then, is it worth pitching two cards to play it? And that's where we're kind of seeing how this goes. Ultimately, though, I mean, take a look at the life totals. It looks like the deck is kind of working for now because Chris Ayali has sent everything in, in the kitchen sink at Nathan Crawford. And Nathan Crawford is, you know, sitting pretty. He hasn't been tickled yet. Yeah, I will say that that is one of the appeals to the crossing is it does block for three. And as I'm looking at a, a lot of these big attacks, they either block for three or they effectively block for three. I'm looking at you, Feindall's Fighting Spirit. So, you know, your Enlightened Strikes, your Command and Conquers, your Autumn's Touches, because they're running Raging Onslaught, Runic Reclamation, Cryptic Crossing. You can have these big haymakers, but you can also be very defensive when you need to be. So we're not seeing Chris get a lot of damage through. Granted, a lot of that has to do with Nathan having the right defense reactions or uh, in the case of Respite Instance at the right time. Uh, here, it's going to be a little bit harder, though, because Frost Lock is on the way, and that is a card that, while it's on the chain, essentially Channel Lake Frigid is in play. This is another one that can give you a little bit of fits if you're trying to respond to it with defense reactions because of that additional tax that you have to pay. And as somebody who's played against a lot of Lexi recently, uh, as a Guardian, I'm not a big fan of this card when it's coming my way because it does a lot of work. So it's going to be met with a Sigil of Suffering, and the Sigil of Suffering is blocking three unless one Arcane goes through. So the question is, does Chris Ayali want to pitch to essentially, you know, swing it by two? I prevent a damage to myself, and you're going to take an extra damage. The Frost Lock is going to hit, and it's going to create a um, a Frostbite because it came off the back of a Red Ice Quake. Red Ice Quake is going to boost that attack by three, and whenever an attack on this combat chain uh, is 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 you know when when it deals damage a, a frostbite is created so chris Ayali's likely not done here there's a go again effect that fra first frostbite is created looks like he's going to go ahead and load the bow again what other arrows does he have in that quiver and it's an endless arrow and this is a nasty one this is one of those cards charmer that when you're kind of evaluating what your opponent is bringing to the table and you're doing that kind of threat density you're checking through their graveyard you're counting things like rain razors. You're counting things like three of a kinds. And when I'm doing it, I'm counting things like endless arrows. Yeah, endless arrow is, like its namesake says, pretty endless when these rangers start using it at the end of chains like we're seeing here, just because they draw out your blocks early and then they make it so you either have to give up your turn so that the endless arrow doesn't go back to their hand or you have to take damage knowing they're just going to get a resource back. So. Many times it ends up just being a free arsenal, but sometimes there might even be a card left so they can keep that in their hand and then they arsenal a different card so they can donate a frostbite, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, this is a card that you're usually not very happy to see. And as a result, we are going to see the double block here trying to prevent it. And there's the press to push it over. It's a great press too. It's not just the press to push damage. It's a press to recover that uh, endless arrow. It's also a press to create a second frostbite. So it looks to me like Nathan Crawford's turn is completely gooned up here. Some of the work has been done. Chris Ayali has finally broken through and in a very devastating way as that endless arrow is back in hand. It's going to get uh, dunked into the arsenal. And the worst part about this charmer is the fact that Nathan Crawford got, you know, got gooned by that endless arrow, by that lightning press and has to deal with it again. Yeah, so as you said, the turn completely gummed up there. I don't know if they had a blue. Theoretically, they could have pitched through the Frostbites if they wanted to swing with the blade, but ultimately they just decided, I'm going to arsenal my card, get rid of these Frostbites, draw back up to four, and Chris finally was able to mount some offense while getting that disruption in. Problem is, Nathan still has a lot of health, so Chris has to do that basically same turn over and over and over to get some value. And uh, there we see the third three of a kind, but this time it's pitched for Voltaire. So that's going to be going to the end of the deck, maybe leaving them with a, a burst at the end of the cycle. I haven't been paying too much attention to what was pitched. So perhaps this is a bit of a, a pitch stacking, but we do have the Bolton shot coming. And no, I do not mean our friend, the warrior Bolton. I mean, Bolt and shot the Ranger attack. What would go in a Bolton shot? Like vodka limoncello 
something. Well, I think I, I assumed it would just be sabers at the end of an arrow, like a bolt and shot. You just put the Centauri sabers on sticks and then you launch them at your opponent. If there was an audi, audi sorry, an audible way for you to hear me shaking my head, I would do it. But that's where we're at. Uh, bolt and shot. A staple for any ranger hero over here. Of course, the go again that you can get out just by boosting the power off of it. A red bolt and shot is five go again. And that's going to be, there's a cryptic crossing. So there's one of those big cards that you're talking about. Uh, one of your favorite new cards, I suppose, from Runeblade. They like to peel cards. Well, that's one way to do it. In this case, it's Chris Ayali coming in for five go again. It's going to be met with an Arctic incarceration. And this is what we're talking about and why this card is so good. Because this card here, perhaps the... Endless Arrow is not all that great. You can't get go again off of it, right? So what I think what's happening here is just saying, all right, you took a little damage. Now we're going to make it miserable for you. We're going to tax you three on top. Arctic Incarceration just bookending that turn, closing up that combat chain with pure free disruption. So one of the things to note there is that the Bolton shot did hit and it does have reload. Uh, Chris decided to not reload and just Arsenal at the end of the turn. But I wonder if there was... A reason for that or if they were just trying to speed through things knowing that they're in for a slug fest here but uh, that is something that we got to keep in mind in the future right Bolton shot great way to extend your turn that's why it's a staple of the rangers here we have the enlightened strike coming speaking of staples this is i believe just the five with go again because i didn't see any motion toward it uh being seven and i guess we'll have to wait and see how this is blocked and what damage is done. Yeah, it, it could be a, a go again. You can use the tunic resource oh. now to complete with a, a, a uh, reaping blade. But I suspect if you're blocking that high, that yeah. tall, it was a, probably a seven. I don't think that there's anything that you should worry about on that case. Chris Ayali doesn't like his hand, apparently, and says, here, it's all yours. Protect the life total, no problem. Yeah, if your hand isn't great and you're already behind, I think doing something like that is fine when you've got two cards in your arsenal. So... <laughs> here it looks like you're just going to say I'll take my turn off but you might be taking your next turn off we're going to flip this arctic incarceration to give you a frostbite and then probably if I had to wager at some point give you three more off of the back of that the question is whether or not you want to use that other card in your hand to uh, pitch give the endless arrows go again and, and take that as a shot or if you just want to play conservative uh, you could just play the arctic and then arsenal your other card looks like that might be the game plan uh, four frostbites is nasty even for a list like nathan crawford's that has a plethora of blues to pay for stuff four on top that's that's pretty gross like we're not gonna even we're not even gonna entertain that is what uh, nathan crawford says his hand might be, just be loaded up with reds in which case chris ayali you know not only just created a scenario where um he's not taking damage. He basically stopped Nathan Crawford's turn, but he may have caught Nathan Crawford with a bad hand that he's going to have to sort of inherit into the next turn. Chris, I believe, just used Lexi to reveal the pulse. So that means uh, you're granting something go again, as well as donating the frostbite. And that means a big turn is coming because now you get to play it as well. Charmer, I just want Pulse of Eisenloff back. You know, like all of these bands, sure, they suck for Oldham. I don't get my Winter's Whale well anymore. But for the love of pizza pie, please give me my gosh darn Pulse of Eisenloff back. Give me something, you know, like part of it is just everybody gets to use it. Like here we see the Pulse of Volthaven. It's such, it's such a beautiful looking card. It does so much. And right now it's pumping up a chilling ice vein up to 10. Like that is massive. And I'm not sure if that was fused, if you caught it, Charmer, but regardless, 10 damage is pretty nasty. I mean, this is 10 with go again. So whether or not it's fused, I think might be irrelevant. Uh, I am wondering if perhaps they missed the frostbite portion of the, the Lexi reveal, because I haven't seen that on Nathan's side. But uh, there we go. I say it and they, they must have heard me, right? This Absolutely. is totally what happened. I guess I should speak quieter. Sorry. Didn't mean to impact the game there, uh, but nonetheless, right? This is going to be 10 damage. You've already got the one frostbite. So uh, even if it's not fused, you can't afford to take that on the chin, followed by whatever is coming and still expect to have a turn. But maybe I'm wrong. We did see Nathan just kind of uh, 
lay down his hand in many ways, not uh, like on the table, obviously, but just say, hey, I'm going to take a turn off because I had four frostbites. There we see the blocks. Looks like you might have been onto something with the potential four red call. Sometimes I'm onto something, Charmer. Sometimes I'm right. Mostly not. But in this case, my spidey senses were tingling. And the question here is, what's Chris Ayali going to do next? I suspect that this is going to be a load up for that arrow with go again. Um, yeah. So this is Heat Seeker. Now, it's got the six there, so I'm not sure if that is go again or not, because that's got a base of five. That tells me Voltaire might have been used for the plus one. Uh, but this is the one that is kind of like reload. So if it hits uh, when your turn ends, you put a card from the top of your deck into your arsenal face up. So you won't be able to flip it with the Lexi effect, but it's still a nice way to kind of extend your hand, extend your resources as you're pushing through. So there, there's like kind of like what we were talking about earlier. That's the third big red attack that was in hand. So Chris Ayali with that Arctic incarceration just basically shut off that entire turn. There was nothing that could have been done. It was all big attacks that are now just going to sit there and soak damage. Um, Chris Ayali put it in work here. That Endless Arrow is still looming large. I thought that this might have been a situation perhaps where um, – Chris Ayali might have gone with the go again and then ended the turn with an endless arrow. However, I think what Chris Ayali's doing here is he wants to pair up that endless arrow with something like lightning press to guarantee that it goes over the top to guarantee that he gets the, uh, the card back. I think that that's something that he's just been very adept at doing is not necessarily going all in on turns, but just going a little above the top, just a little above the top and forcing Nathan to perhaps block in a way that he's taking damage because he's afraid of that Endless Arrow. I would have suspected if Nathan Crawford dumped his hand to block this, that Endless Arrow would have, of course, come out. But Chris Ayali has been very patient with that card. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to highlight, is that in many ways, having a face-up Endless Arrow sitting over there can help you leak damage through just by the threat of it. Because as you said, if Nathan had decided, hey, I'm just going to block this full 10 on the first one, Nathan has to assume that... Chris is just going to pitch a blue and fire off endless arrow twice, right? You're going to get that damage through one way or the other. So instead, Nathan did a partial block and then you were able to come in with that heat seeker after the fact. So sometimes endless arrow, it's kind of like the mask of momentum, but for Ranger, you can just leave it threatening back there and it alters the way your opponent blocks as a result. This is a chilling ice cream yellow if i'm not mistaken which is going to come in for four i believe that's four go again no problems here i didn't catch if it was fused or not ultimately though nathan crawford on the hook for four damage and that's just the first chapter of the story here that uh briar list we haven't really seen anything from it we haven't seen of, outside of that initial turn of the barraging bronhai to open up turn zero i haven't really seen any of those fireworks we there was a cryptic crossing that really didn't have all the potency behind it that it may have liked, but all of these other haymakers that we were discussing, like give me a command and conquer pummel, you know, give me, uh, um, you know, anything at this rate, you know, I, I want to see some of these cards connecting, but it doesn't seem like Nathan Crawford has given any breathing room. Chris Ayali has been smothering him with arrows. Yeah, that was the thing that I was trying to highlight, obviously at the start of the match, right? How does <laughs> How does Nathan get through all of this tax? Well, it turns out the tax is problematic, but so is just big arrows. We've seen a lot of very tall attacks come from Chris here. Again, we see the heat seeker coming uh, a second time. So that was a chilling ice vein. It was not fused, but you just kind of leak through that four damage and then you present another real threat here. Uh, because of the six showing again, I assume this does not have go again. One of the things we do have to keep an eye on though is that just because it doesn't naturally have go again, the snaps are always looming as well. So Nathan still has to consider, you know, if I empty my hand here to, to stop this, is my opponent going to be able to fire off the endless arrows as well? Uh, we know that right now Chris doesn't have any additional resources in hand. It doesn't look like they've got uh, three counters on the tunic. So it would just be uh, firing the endless arrows off from the arsenal, but that would still be you know, essentially free damage. All these on-hit effects are so glorious on Chris Ayali's side. He's going to have to go ahead and expend another sink below to cover that up, protecting the life total still. It's been quite a while. I mean, this game is 
you know, we're 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 well into it, and we finally see Nathan Crawford, you know, showing a little signs of life, finally kicking back here. That's a finals fighting spirit. It's going to be seven. There's none of that game text on the actual card itself that's going to help you out. But seven attack, Chris Ayali finally going to have to make a decision on the blocking side. Yeah, when the game text doesn't matter, one of my favorite things to do is say just seven. It's usually <laughs> with an enlightened strike, right? You just go, okay, well, I'm just swinging for seven. But turns out seven's still pretty relevant. It's that exact annoying number where if they don't have something like a sink below, it makes the break points awkward where you can still leak through one damage while also chewing up two cards. Uh, Chris must have a great hand because they opted to just take all of that saying, hey, if there's no game text, then health is a resource and it's time that I start using it again so that I can go back on offense. Well, we're going to start it off. That's an amulet of ice with a go again effect. We'll see if he can fuse something and maybe punch through the pitch of hypothermia to load an arrow here. It means that two are floating. That is another chilling ice vein. These chilling ice veins, again, a nine spot of them in the deck. It's going to get fused with cold snap. So this is going to get gross because we're going to see if Chris Ayali is going to actually fire off on that amulet of ice. I think, like you mentioned, given the fact that it can be done at instant speed, Chris Ayali has the option here to see how the blocks kind of shape up before he commits to it. Yeah, so I think earlier, Chris, when he was looking at his discard pile, might have been counting ice cards because it had been a while since we had seen any fuses. And then, of course, he draws the hand that's ice vein and three ice cards. So uh, does finally get to threaten that. I think that he was happy with the way that turned out, so he didn't want to use the amulet there to strip any more cards. I think you wait for when you're setting up a big turn with endless arrow because you can use the amulet to strip anything that would be the last block and then you can cycle through the endless you know maybe one or two times on top of it but this is something that's going to demand an answer this is the nightmare scenario when you have two cards in your arsenal and your opponent is coming with that command and conquer and when you've seen a list like nathan's up to this point you have to assume that pummel is something uh, that you're worried about it's also just pointing out, this is also uh, one resource floating and you have Tunic over there. So the one card in hand is, uh, again, very threatening as that pummel. This is the classic like, oh, I only have one floating. It's not a pummel, but, you know, I've got Tunic sitting over there. Moment of truth. And uh, it does look like there was no pummel. I'm just going to keep talking until uh, Flake realizes his mic is muted. Yeah, that I, was I it. Sorry, I was coughing like a... Talk, yeah, I was and then uh, I was just like, all right, like well, I'll, I'll just uh, keep going. That's fine. No, you hit all the points I was relating to, which was the one float plus the tunic there. And oftentimes when I'm playing, it is such an awesome feeling when you're presenting a big attack and they just, they look at it. And sometimes if I don't have it, if I don't have the pummel, I'll make a point of reminding them that I might. Well, I'll say... All right, it's just it's an you know it's a choke slam. I got one float, tunic up, card and arsenal, and then hopefully that telegraphs to them that they should overblock or they should respect the pummel, and maybe I can get greasy like that. But you best believe, you best believe, charmer, when I do have the pummel, I am silent. <laughs> I am absolutely silent. Yeah, you always want to try to catch people that are just paying attention to the pitch and not necessarily your equipment, but. No pummel that time. Meanwhile, on the other side, Chris has now set up two amulets. So again, as we kind of talk about a potential pop off turn, normally you do it on the back of something like three of a kind. But if you get a really solid fuse and then you've got good pitch for that endless arrow, you could strip cards from their hand one at a time, uh, instant speed with those amulets. But uh, might not be relevant, might not matter. We have another Command and Conquer threatening the two cards in the arsenal. And Chris says, all right, you didn't have the pummel the last time. Hopefully you still didn't draw one because I'm only going to block with two cards. Well, that's a good point here. So Chris Ayali took the risk in the previous game or in the previous turn. He's taking the risk again now. And I think Nathan Crawford is just kind of kicking himself here because a pummel would completely change the dynamic of this game. You're not just peeling a card from hand and doing damage. You're basically blowing up two cards excuse me, from Arsenal, of which one is an endless arrow, and that's a major threat that you need to address. Uh, and it's starting off with a frostbite off the Lexi trigger. That cold snap is basically going to ask Nathan Crawford, say, hey, buddy, do you want to freeze your Arsenal? How much do you care about it? So we're going to see if Nathan Crawford respects this cold snap here. Um, 
and how Chris Ayali responds in turn, what attacks he's going to play, and if those Amulets of Ice are going to get uh, played. Now, I suspect, Charmer, that those Amulets of Ice are probably going to get paired up down the line with that three of a kind that we saw, uh, that we got oh. pitched a couple little while ago, but we're, we'll see. I mean, it's there's still uh, there's still too much life, I think, for Nathan Crawford to be thinking um, about not pushing damage, about not equalizing the game. Chris Ayali is at 19 here, and if he eats two big turns to try to get to that big turn, you know that it, it might not be enough. But those amulets of ice can be played to close out a game, but it could also be played to just perhaps survive. Yeah, so I was about to say, I think it depends on how the blocks go here because this is almost like a three of a kind turn already by itself when you have the endless down there because it is the same as just drawing that arrow over and over again. And because you ramped up your resources with the cold snap, it's almost like giving you that crown of seeds feel because you played it from Arsenal. So you draw a card when you pitched a blue, then you're netting resources. Uh, then that could have been a way to go, right? Where after that Bolton shot was blocked, maybe uh, you could try to push it through. But I think the only reason we didn't see that here was you didn't have a fuse. If that Bolton shot was something like a chilling ice vein, then I think that could have been a turn where you considered popping off. The idea is you want them to block the first arrow, you strip their remaining cards with the amulets, and then you just fire off with either the endless or whatever is left. But with no fuse there, instead you just chew through the hand of Nathan and yes, that you know feels like a victory because Nathan takes a turn off, but uh, you are a hero that doesn't have a, a weapon that can attack. So there is a very real threat of fatigue at this point. I'm looking at the deck size of Chris over there, and it's starting to get pretty small. I've been in games against Lexi players where eventually all they have left are like blue arrows and they need to pitch it to something. But it's, it's a very nasty reality when you realize that at the end of the day, you know, you do not have any arrows left to, to throw at people. You're not, you don't have the long knives of Legolas to sort of back you up here. You just have that bow and you can't swing it like a baseball bat. That's not what's, it's not how Lexi works. Okay. That's not how the force works and it's not going to work in this case. So I think what you have to do here, if you're Chris Ayali and you're staring down a deficit of 21, uh, of 11 life, your opponent's still sitting pretty at 30. You got to make sure that you're, you're you're basically cobbling together one hell of a turn because you need to not just convert on damage but convert on momentum and keep firing through you need to make this hurt and chris ayali with that uh, with that pitched three of a kind and these two amulets of uh, ice on the board can maybe make it happen but we're going to see how it works cuz right now a blizzard bolt that's getting uh fused uh, is going to represent five damage with the go again on hit create a frostbite yeah, and this is like Ice Quake. So it's whenever any attack damages a hero, you make a frostbite. So this one is threatening, and then any future ones would also be threatening. This could be one of those turns where you strip Nathan's hand or you make them, again, kind of have an irrelevant turn on their own. We're going to see the double block here. I think Nathan might just have realized I'm going to win by fatigue, right? I'm at 30 so it's not even the health deficit between the two that matters. It's the fact that I'm at 30. So if I full block 12 every turn from here on out, what is my opponent going to do to push 30 damage over the top of that with what's left in their deck? Now, we know that there's no remembrance that uh, Chris brought as this Lexi player. Uh, Nathan doesn't necessarily know that. But even if you assume Chris did bring remembrance, you know, one or two is probably not enough to get that much momentum going here when you're still at 30 on the side of Nathan. At the moment now, that Blizzard Bolt is being met by a Runic Reclamation and a Smashing Good Time. That's going to block it out in full. Chris Ayali perhaps just deciding, all right, I got two cards out of him. I can, you know, I can break open one of these, uh, I can break open one of these uh, amulets, peel a card out of the hand, and then maybe I, I come through with this Endless Arrow. The problem is, is there still that Crown of Providence? And that can, you know, pair up with a card in hand to block out that, uh, to, uh, to block out the Endless Arrow. Even if you, you know, even if you fire it with a plus one effect, but you can't because it's already an arsenal. You're not loading the arrow. The Voltaire ability will only affect an arrow that gets loaded on the particular turn. That Endless Arrow 
has honestly had a front row seat to this entire skirmish and has just waited and 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 is biding its time. And I think Chris Ayali is going to eventually get rewarded on that. Yeah, there just hasn't been a very great and opportune time to use it. It's such a powerful tool that you don't want to waste it. And the few times that Chris could have potentially fired it off, it would have been at the expense of, you know, risking it for four damage. And I don't know, right now that just doesn't feel like it's the the best use of that. Again, I think you really want to set up your big combo turn where you use the ambulance to strip any remaining cards and then perhaps you give yourself some sort of way to fire that endless arrow off, you know, two times plus with another arrow. That's maybe how you close this gap. But the reality is the time is ticking because again, that deck size is getting smaller and smaller. And in the meantime, Nathan's health is not getting smaller and smaller. And so right now we've got this raging that is, you know, threatening damage to Chris and Chris is in a bit of a bind. He doesn't want to block because he needs every card at his disposal left in the deck, but he also doesn't want to take this damage because this is effectively a third of his health. This feels to me like it's just somebody brought, they just basically opened a box of Welcome to Wraith and just made a deck out of whatever they had. You know, when you say things like Raging Onslaught, you're thinking limited. You're not necessarily thinking uh, constructed, but it's getting the job done. Chris Ayali is just, you know, contemplated. He pondered that, that, damage being sent through and decided at the end of the day to just go ahead and soak a bit of it and that's because there's a probably a pretty big turn coming up and it's going to start with the flipping of the lexi uh the, the arsenal which is going to be a channel like frigidic frostbite appears on nathan crawford's side of the board but nathan crawford's got to be thinking like i can just take all, i could take a whole turn off if i want to i can go to the fridge i could you know start making some some ramen and come back and I'll probably still be alive and that's okay. And as it stands right now, it looks like Chris Ayali is probably wondering, all right, we got to, we got to start maybe slowing Nathan down. And a good way to start with that is a channel like frigid. But like we mentioned, when this is not a, a, a your typical Briar list, such an unorthodox build, things like channel like frigid are not going to get the same mileage as they would against a red line or a or go wide ver uh, version. Well, the other problem at this stage in the game is that you're at 12 health, but your opponent's still at 30 and you're running out of cards and Channel Lake Frigid doesn't get their health down any lower. Like you're keeping yourself alive, but at what cost? If you can't generate offense here, I don't think it's super relevant. So it might just be the case of, hey, I didn't have anything else to really do here, but you could make the argument that maybe you keep that channel like frigid in your hand and you fuse this blizzard bolt. Uh, I don't know that that's that much better either, but if your opponent only takes one attack, you know, the frostbite from the blizzard bolt connecting would have been the same as the channel like frigid. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how, how you get out of this. If you're Chris, like I don't want to be super defeatist here, but this is not looking good when you're staring at the game state. Uh, you, really wish you had remembrance you really wish that you would have forced some more damage through i i don't know how you deal 30 damage as a ranger from this game state well keep in mind there's still that three of a kind that is floating about and if chris ayali kind of stacked the deck he could potentially just open up uh you know a, a giant can of whoop ass if that's uh i say that because royal rumble is in a couple days in fact actually today's saturday uh so yeah, Royal Rumble's tonight, baby. So damn right we're going to open a can of whoop-ass. Uh, and I think that's what Chris Ayali's trying to do, is he's trying to sort of stack the deck so that three of a kind finds more arrows. And then and then you have opportunities to go Bullseye Bracer to reload. You can use your Snapdragons to get go again. You might see turn where he'll pair up a, a, another Rain Razors into those three to four arrow turns, and hopefully that gets him there. But at the moment, Chris Ayali has done, you know, fair has been fairly quiet i mean i say quiet it's not necessarily that chris ayali hasn't been pushing he's cobbled together some very potent turns nathan crawford has just been completely comfortable saying all right just take it i'll wait i'll wait the ice out and we'll get there eventually because all i need is a blue pitch and a big attack and it's going to make you quiver yeah it's actually really interesting you know we were highlighting reaping blade early on those early turns were where a lot of that damage came from Nathan, and it was just because it was a one pitch, you know, threaten three, or you pitch a blue and you threaten four. So 
it was almost like a non-conditional Rosetta Thorn with pairing it with the Grasp of the Arc Knight there. So uh, an interesting tactic from Nathan where he could go defensive and then still have Thorn-like value by pitching a blue, and it seems to have paid off. I just, I keep going back to with Nathan at 30 and the deck size where it is with Chris, even if he does have that explosive turn you were talking about, let's say he gets the best uh, possible outcome. He gets the rain, he gets three of a kind, he fires off four arrows that are one for fives. So that's, you know, seven times four is 28. That unblocked is still not enough to kill Nathan. And you have to assume he'd block with his full hand there. And then what's left in your deck, right? Like that's what I keep coming back to here. Another Bolton shot being presented here. This is the yellow. Yellow's coming in for, uh, it's going to be represent the three. Now it, it's, uh, it's just three. I don't know how he's pairing this up, but it's not going to get a natural go again because it's not over the top of what it typically would be. Unless that's a blue and my eyes are deceiving me. Uh, that does appear to be a yellow to me as well. So I don't think that it has... The, the natural go again. However, uh, there should still be one Ray, uh, Rain Razors left, and that is an instant. So uh, you could try to bait out a one card block and then play it. Or there is the press that will also get the job done. So we see that coming over the top. That's going to give it the go again, give it the reload. Uh, finally, gets some damage in on Nathan. It's funny, I was just about to talk about how I felt Nathan was navigating this because that 30 felt like it was a magic number as I realized that that math in my head about, okay, if you three of a kind, you get four arrows, you know, at five uh, piece plus the rain, then as long as you stay above 28, you can't be killed. And uh, Nathan now goes below that 28 value. We'll see if that ends up mattering. But I think that that might've been Nathan's game plan for quite some time was just saying, hey, if I can't die in a single turn, then I'm in control of this matchup. And now we see a chilling ice vein coming. Uh, this is fused. Amulets are live. I really do believe that Chris Ayali might be looking for that three of a kind, picking up that chilling, picking up a chilling ice vein off of those draws, starting the turn with the chilling ice vein go again, fused, and then just peeling all the cards out of Nathan Crawford's hand and saying, okay, let's go. Because every arrow that hits now is going to peel a card out of your hand. It's going to cost you one. It's going to do something special. And Chris Ayali, you know, didn't necessarily get the work done earlier. But here's a, th yeah, this is a, th a block for six. Still, uh, you know, susceptible to a potential lightning press, but it looks like we're content to just, I guess, bust it up and uh, pass on over. No problem. Yeah, I think you are correct that Chris is just waiting for that combo turn because if you get the three of a kind and the rain, the rain is also really important if you're trying to cycle through endless arrow over and over and over. And we finally see the third command and conquer coming from Nathan. So far, these have not been pummeled when they have showed up. But if there was ever a time where it would decide a game, this would be it. This would be a devastating time to have a pummel. I don't know if you've got uh, any cards left in hand for Nathan though and there's only uh, no there is uh, they just don't have the marker that was a blue pitched um I think there was the the tax though there was I don't believe there was a I don't think there was a uh, a tax I don't think there's a frostbite on the stack there might be one floating here I could be wrong yeah we'll, we'll double check here ultimately though it is still a command and conquer on the stack. There's a card in, uh, in is, no, there's no card in hand. There's, there's no card in, in arsenal, hand, though. but there is a card in arsenal and there is the tunic. And so that's why I was wondering whether or not there is a, a float and they haven't put the, the marker out there. So I'm questioning it. I know that obviously Channel Lake Frigid was out for a bit, but I thought that went away. Uh, the ice vein didn't connect. So I don't think there was any frostbite. I think there actually still might be one floating here yeah he's he's pointing at that so perhaps he's saying you know there is the the one float we'll see we will see um if there is one floating there's certainly the threat of a pummel out of arsenal in conjunction with that tunic resource that's been floating there i don't think he's really used his tunic almost at all this entire game and uh, speaking of tunics chris is gonna give his up so this is blocking six 
because uh, that that is a two block and uh, does appear uh, whether there was a float or not. Nathan does not have the pummel to jam on there. And again, I, I feel like that would have been backbreaking. If you had a pummel there, you could have, you know, blown up the two cards in Arsenal, stripped a card from hand. And with as small as Chris's library is at this point, I just don't think there would have been enough gas at, at that stage. But maybe he's just not playing it. I mean, we've gone through the entire deck. I haven't seen one pitched even i i haven't um i would be i guess kind of surprised if you weren't playing it just because command and conquer with the pummel is so good into ranger but maybe they instead took that out and boarded in the defensive options again we have seen the oasis respites we've seen the sinks etc etc so uh, perhaps the game plan was fatigue from the get-go right we've seen the sigil of sufferings as well so even more defense reactions uh, perhaps Pummel was just not on their radar. Doesn't block for three. Nathan Crawford getting an opportunity again. Hey, there's what we're talking about. Attack action, non-attack action. Finally, we get to see the full potential of a card like Cryptic Crossing. Now, when this hits, the first time it hit deals damage, they discard a card, and Nathan gets to draw a card. But yeah. there's no go again off this. So but it does, there doesn't need is... there, there doesn't need to be. Let me tell you why I love this. This is this is what I was waiting for, Flake. Uh, there is two floating because of the way you pitched to get that being active. So there's no go again. But if if you get a pummel on this, you are destroying their hand. Like let's say you two block it because it's a six and you don't want the effect to go off. Then you throw the pummel over top. Then they've uh, still taken damage. They have no hand. And you got to draw a card so you could like re arsenal up like this again. It's not quite command and conquer devastating, but this could be a very devastating time to have a pummel. Now, of course, I, I don't think that the pummels are in at this point. As you said, we haven't seen any come through, but you know, if you're if you're Chris, I think you still have to respect it, right? You you don't know if he may be left in one. There's, yeah, so there's one floating, uh, Cryptic Crossing costing three, pitching the red into the blue, one float, but the Tunic resource is still available. But if you are pushing a Pummel over the top, I think you just pitch the card and play it out of Arsenal to get on top of this, uh, because you're drawing a card anyways, so might as well just keep the resource there. Seems to me like he's just taking the damage and discarding a card. This is kind of nasty, is Chris Ayeli is now down to six. He's just saying, you know, he's been very protective of the arsenal against the command and conquerors but i'm pretty sure all three cncs are gone now so the arsenal is relatively safe chris ayali has to get some work done here and perhaps this is the time he found it we're going to find out very soon as he's going to go ahead and reveal lexi it's another channel like frigid a frostbite is going to appear on nathan's side again so he's got one extra to uh, go ahead and pay through on his turn the question is, is what can chris ayali do on this turn to make nathan crawford perhaps shake a little in his boots because one frostbite's a nice start, but you got to pair this up with some actual damage, some actual on hit threats. Yeah, this is a really strong opening, I guess, if you're worried about things like uh, defense reactions, right? Because you force them to have to pitch to pay for their defense reactions. But outside of that, uh, it doesn't feel great right like it's very strong if that's your concern and obviously chris has a, a better grasp i think at this point of which ones have been played so now we do have the rain followed by the three of a kind so this is it chris is going all in and i i don't think that he can uh, afford to not deal massive amounts of damage here just no two ways about it you you need to find something to fuse so we see the channel go out now uh, but you need to find something to fuse, strip the cards from hand with the amulets, and then get the job done. Or if if you're not killing Nathan here, and I don't think that you probably can, you have to at least get him to parity, right? Like you've got to get him low enough to where you're at least threatening lethal from here on out. You see a pitch. Voltaire is going to load a frost lock. Yeah, Okay. Uh, this is definitely, in my opinion, him saying, I don't want you to have any sort of defense reactions because we're fusing the frost lock. So between Channel Lake Frigid, the frostbite you've donated, and now the frost lock being on the chain, uh, even something like a sink below costs you three. And taxing these cards is going to be clutch. So 
D reacts are coming in at a premium, and this frost lock at uh, frost lock at six is starting to get the job done a little bit. The rain raisers is going to put it over the top. The question is, is this is going to be enough to perhaps get Nathan to pause a bit to give him a little bit of uh, of concern chris ayali at six against a deck that just sends it every turn that it can every card that it has to send at you is going to be a fat attack so every card is like blue pitch lethal blue pitch lethal so chris ayali has to be well aware of that and part of that is going to be to all right we getting nathan to a, a, a position where his life total dwindles but also he's got no cards in hand to potentially send it back so I think he was just saying, hey, the uh, card that I fused with was the Winter's Bite. I think Nathan wanted to verify it wasn't another arrow there. But again, the Endless Arrow that has been there for so long, still potentially enough to continue threatening damage. The snaps are still there as well, so you don't even have to use the Voltaire for go again, for example. Like you can uh, decide, hey, this is my all in turn. Let's get some extra damage when we do fire off the endless at some point. The amulet device are instants, so you can again wait till the blocks are are divvied up here. Another thing worth noting: uh, it doesn't come up often, but the frost lock, what, because it was fused, it has that relevant on hit as well, where uh, cards that cost zero can't be pitched or played. So when you go to activate those amulets, they might have to be straight up discarded as opposed to pitched to paying the tax. All right, let's see how this goes. Six attacks still on the stack. Nathan Crawford trying to figure out how he's going to address this. First block is being presented. It's come to fight. Non-attack action. That is a wonderful card from uh, Arcane Rising, a three block nonetheless. But it's being Whoa. shoved in front of the, uh, uh, the frost lock here. I don't think that's enough, though. Yeah, I mean, you're going to take damage, but it's technically a four block because the... Uh embodiment over there right so very efficient block from nathan as you're trying to keep this going and this i game think is, uh, this game has they, been going on a long time my friend yeah i was gonna say i think that they just uh paid uh with a pitch there but uh, I'm not sure what it was for they paid one for something they uh one of the amulets got dunked so uh Nathan pitched to pay for the additional. He had one floating, so he pitched another three, two left. Uh, he paid for the discard effect uh, or from the effect from the amulet. And here's the uh, Endless Arrow finally getting a shot in. Put me in, coach. And it's there. Six attack, one card left in hand. Uh, sorry, two cards left in hand. This might actually peel the rest of the hand away, giving uh, Chris Ayali perhaps the, the runway he needs, the momentum he needs to close this out. All right. All right. Looks so, like the whole block is there. He's, he's just gonna ice out this entire uh, this entire onslaught here. Yeah, this is I think going to be the full block, and we know that Chris uh, just has that Winter's Bite in hand, so there's no lightning press to go over the top. Um, I think that instead of giving that one go again, I would have liked to have seen the plus one damage from uh, Voltaire somehow, but you actually couldn't because it was already there, right? So that one you just had to fire off. I think there was no way around it. So uh, Chris coming up short in that, I, I think that's got to be it, right? Chris has, it looks like, just a small number of cards left in the deck. And with Nathan still at 22 health, I, I find it very hard to imagine he can deal that much damage with so few cards. See what we can do, but uh, we're going to start by opening up with the Winter's Bite Blue, creating a Frostbite. He's actually going to play it. This is going to cost him a card because that Tudic is no longer anywhere good. Uh, pitching a, that is a Force of Nature to float. So that to float is going to address the amulet should it want to be used here. Chris Ayali, I think, is just running out of gas. Um, running out of arrows, running out of gas. That big turn, the Rain Razors into the Three of a Kind did nothing. Did Frankly, didn't really do a whole lot it uh, pushed uh, nathan down to 22 and chris ayali here at six is just trying to try to make a mountain out of a molehill he's going to go ahead and fuse another frost lock but it's just it's just five and i say just five because nathan can just comfortably throw a couple cards in front of this even one but uh, he's going to go ahead and uh, send the whisper of the oracle another card in front of it should full block this chris ayali unfortunately is just 
all right, let's let's figure it out. Yeah, we're at the stage in the game where Nathan is just fully blocking everything because, again, he's got a weapon. So as long as he's got cards left in his deck, he can always still swing. Whereas Chris, because he's a ranger and see, we see the weapon swing now uh, because he's a ranger, he needs those arrows to fire. And so as long as Nathan fully blocks out all of the arrows, there is nothing that Chris can do to go over the top. And I think we are hitting that stage now. Uh, we're going to see the Channel Lake Frigid, so that Reaping Blade will cost a little bit more. But unfortunately, Channel Lake Frigid doesn't deal damage. Chilling Ice Vein does. Does it deal 22, though? It doesn't deal 22. And this is the plight of the, the Ranger is late in the game all those blue arrows are coming back the ones that you pitch for fuel to be aggressive early and unfortunately they are not packing the same kind of punch that you hope they would those arrows are rather just you know punchless uh, four attack arrow is going to be met by two cards on the combat chain nathan crawford is to say all right cool well uh one in three let's do it why the hell not i'll pay right through it. that frostbite yeah, Chris, uh, just going down to zero there. Yeah, he's got cards he could block, but with no deck left, just accepts defeat. And with a very, you know, unconventional deck, Nathan looked strong in that matchup. Nathan did look strong in that matchup uh, from a position of defensive prowess. I mean, a lot of those cards he had blocked for three. There was a lot of understanding that if you're playing against a, a ranger, you could just kind of at a certain degree turtle up. And he did a good job of really keeping his life total to uh, an acceptable level where when he did find the gas that he needed, he could perhaps absorb. The difference is, is that Lexi has a lot of on-hit effects that you have to respect. So there wasn't a lot of opportunity for Nathan to go ahead and hit back. But when he did, it was, all right, well, pitch a blue, throw you seven. Pitch a blue, throw you seven. Like the threat of the pummels as well was always live. You see the command and conquerors that were busted through and with the, the resources floating as well. Like that is a tale as old as time. That is basically bluffing at the poker table when it comes to flesh and blood. And Chris Ayali said, well, you didn't have it on the first go around. I didn't see you pitch it. And we caught on to that as well. Eventually that list was not running pummel, but boy, oh boy, that game could have ended a lot sooner if it was. Yeah, it's actually, in my opinion, very interesting that Nathan decided to pivot the way that he did. He, this is him just understanding flesh and blood core concepts and then adjusting. Because when I looked at this list, I thought, OK, this is very much I'm going to throw haymakers. I'm going to use reaping blade so that they can't continue to gain health. And then once we get low enough, I'm just going to trust that I'm more card efficient, right? If I keep a two card hand, I can threaten seven over and over again and I'll win the game. But that's not what happened. He said, OK, I'm against a ranger. I can blue pitch and threaten four, which is good enough. They can't do that. So if I just use all of my big three blocks, if I board in my defensive options, the sigils, the oasis respites, etc., I can just outlast them and get the victory that way. And that's exactly what happened. So even though they've got this haymaker heavy list and I'm excited to see what they do in the next round, they just said, hey, I can go the other direction if I need to against a ranger. Well, that wraps it up for our Saturday action at the Goliath Gauntlet. Number two, that would be Nathan Crawford moving on to the semifinals. Stay tuned for tomorrow. We've got one hell of a matchup again for you. They're all great. This one specifically uh, hits close to home for me. It's going to be Tarek Patel, the Canadian national champion, is going to be playing against Daniel Rutkowski. And that is your Sunday quarterfinal matchup. It should wrap up uh, the weekend of action here at the Goliath Gauntlet 2. I want to say thank you again to LSS for your support on this and of course to kayfabe cards you guys rock go to kayfabecards.com go check it out singles sealed product go support those who support us charmer it is always a pleasure my friend um yeah that, i mean do you got a favorite for this tournament you got a, a name that you think's gonna take it home i do actually majin bay everybody slept on him the last time he came out victorious he is incredibly competitive when it comes to card games does not want to lose his title. It is going to take a lot of effort to take it away from Caleb. So I, I know that it's easy to just, oh, you picked the winner from the last time, but the reality is he puts in the work and he wants to win this again. Well, then we have to get through the quarterfinals and that will be tomorrow. So lock it in here at youtube.com slash 983 media for more Goliath Gauntlet.